I have known Tom Donlan for a long time. We were together in the Clinton administration when he worked uh, as the right hand of Secretary of State Warren Christopher. Uh, he has had an extremely distinguished career in Washington, uh, culminating most recently with his term as the National Security Advisor to President Obama, which uh, continued through till July 1st. July 1st. And, um, uh, you know, I have uh, written about National Security uh, Council and National Security Advisors, um, and we've had a, a widely different group of people, some of whom uh, were primarily political, some of whom were more bureaucratic, some of whom were more tactical, some of whom were more strategic. Um, Tom blended a lot of the best attributes of these, uh, and you know we made a, I made a joke earlier about thinkers in Washington. Um, uh, one of the things that struck me in going to visit Tom in his office was the piles of books on his desk, uh, and that he was immersing himself uh, in the latest thinking on a huge range of issues: regional issues, topical issues, energy. Uh, cyber, the, the last major uh, summit that you participated in with the Chinese turned on the issue of, of cyber. Um, he played an absolutely central role in shaping the strategic rebalancing to Asia, uh, but he was, of course, directly involved in everything. As I said to you before, the way I'd like to run this session um, is uh, to turn to you very, very early on for your questions. Um, I, th I thought I'd offer one at the beginning just to sort of carry over from the conversation we had at the beginning uh, with Tony Blinken, um, uh, and then move from there into whatever areas you want to go. Uh, so I'm really counting on all of you um, to, uh, to, to offer up some questions and really cover the range of, of, of issues, and I'll move out among you in a moment. But, but you know, when we started with with Tony, we started talking really about the Iran issue uh, because in some ways it represents a different kind of strategic rebalancing, or at least in the minds of a lot of people it does. Because from 1979 through now, much of our policy was involved in containing Iran as the principal threat to the extent that uh, during the Reagan administration we even provide intelligence to the Iraqis. Um, which unfortunately led to you know, chemical weapons attacks on the Iranians, but we were, that was our focus. Um, and it was also kind of a bulwark of some of our core alliances with the Saudis, with other Gulf states that saw Iran as a potential threat, with the Israelis that saw Iran as a different kind of a threat. And so naturally, as we move to a new phase, where we seem to be at least talking to the Iranians in a different way, um, and considering this very significant uh, nuclear deal, which may or may not happen, but there, there is this kind of sense of anxiety that it's not just a deal about Iranian nukes with all the caveats that go with that. Will it work? Will it not? Will they play by the rules? Will they not? But also that there is this kind of sea change associated with it. Um, and that if the United States tilts a little bit more towards accommodating Iran, that'll have negative consequences in the Gulf, negative consequences for Israel. Ne and, and so there's unease. And I was just wondering if you might address that. Yeah, there is. There is. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here today. It's great to be here today. I know a number of your Global Thinker honorees are here today as well. It's a pleasure to be here with them as, uh, as well. And thank you for the contribution that foreign policy makes. I know it's sponsored by the I, I know the people, the policy planning, the State Department know how much I value them. Foreign policy also has a real, incredibly important contribution to the intellectual capital. It's so necessary for effective decision making and so difficult to get when you're in the, kind of the maelstrom of everyday policy making. With respect to, uh, with respect to Iran, let's put, uh, let's put first things first, I think is what I, would, what I would say. We have a very serious security problem with respect to the Iranian nuclear program. And that's the focus of this effort. Uh, and it should be the focus of this effort. It's, it is a goal that is preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon, acquiring a nuclear weapon, that is agreed upon by the United States, the Gulf Arabs, and Israel. And that is the purpose and goal of the exercises underway today. Uh, we've been focused on this problem for a long time. The Obama administration focused on this problem from the outset. 
I probably spent as much time on this issue as any issue, and we had a lot of things going on over the course of four and a half years, uh, because of the serious nature of the security, security situation here. Um, Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon, obviously, would be, uh, is unacceptable to the United States for all the reasons that President Obama has laid out. Uh, it's threat to uh, our, our, our partners and allies in the region. Uh, it's threat to the, to the global non-proliferation regime, um, and all the rest. Uh, I think that the uh, approach that's being taken right now by the administration, I'm sure Tony went through this in some detail today, is the right approach. And indeed, I think that this initial step approach uh, is extre extremely valuable because it addresses a real problem that we were concerned about in opening up a negotiation with the Iranians. And the Israelis were, were concerned about it. And I spent, as you know, David, an enormous amount of time in consultation with the Israelis on this problem and with our, our friends and partners in the Gulf. And the problem was, the challenge was to prevent the Iranians during the pendency of negotiations from advancing and accelerating their program. And that's not going to happen with this initial step approach. The initial step approach has a number of elements to it which I think are absolutely critical, and they address that issue directly. It freezes the amount of 3.5 percent the Iranian that they'll have at the end of the six-month period. Um, it goes directly to uh, neutralizing, if you will, the 20 percent enriched uranium. Uh, it, uh, it, it puts in place, and this hasn't been underscored, I don't think, enough, a very aggressive and intrusive monitoring and, uh, uh, regime at places where we've never been monitoring, right? At centrifuge production facilities and other things along the supply line, at uranium uh, mills and uh, uh, mines. Uh, very important, I think. And it addresses uh, an issue that the Israeli government has raised, uh, I think appropriately, which is the, another source of potential poten uh, fissile material, the plutonium plant plutonium producing heavy water nuclear reactor planned at Iraq, Iran. It addresses all those things, it freezes it in place, and it provides an opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to have a negotiation. Uh, the challenge here will be, from my perspective, uh, is on the Iranian side. Uh, the Iranians uh, uh, need to understand what's going to be required, and that we'll see if they do, uh, because it will, it will involve substantial rollback in this, uh, uh, with, respect to their, uh, with respect to their program. Uh, and that they're going to have to demonstrate to the world in a, in a very uh, uh, clear uh, fashion with a lot of protections that this program uh, is, is for peaceful purposes uh, and can't advance towards uh, uh, a uh, military purpose. So it's, it's an important opportunity, but I guess in response to your question, I would say yes, there's some tensions about it, but, the, but, the, but the, I think it's first things first. This is first and foremost a security challenge that we have to deal with, and that is the threat of an Iranian uh, nuclear program. Again, uh, we've gotten here, by the way, through uh, international cooperation. Uh, there's a direct line here between the sanctions that have been put in place over the course of the last two administrations. Uh, we put in place in the Obama administration very uh, substantial and intensive sanctions. That doesn't work, though, without international cooperation. The United States doesn't have an economic relationship with Iran, uh, uh, and it took a lot of diplomacy to put this together. So the work that's been done has been a truly international project. It has forced the choice that the sanctions were uh, we'll see. It's a, it, it could be forced in the choice uh, that the sanctions were intended to force. That is a choice on the part of the Iranians to either uh, have your economy uh, continue to suffer and move towards collapse, or make a choice to uh, make an arrangement with the international community that demonstrates peaceful purpose. That choice has been is put on the table here. We'll see if the Iranian government can take, can take that up. But again, my, my answer to you would be first things first here. Do you, one of the things that it's brought out, yeah. um, or, or one of the things that's happened simultaneously is we, we, you know, we were involved in this kind of, we'd taken sides in this kind of Sunni-Shiite struggle that had existed in the region with the Iranians being on, on one side of it, many of our allies being on the other side of it. Um, but since that struggle began, and frankly because of some of the dislocation associated with the wars involved, and. Uh, some associated with the corruption of governments and growing inequality, there's simultaneously been a split within the Sunni world. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Syria, you have the Iranian-supported Assad regime, and you've got uh, a kind of Sunni group that's primarily supported by moderate states in the region, and another one that's more extremist. Uh, when you look at Egypt, there was, there was this real divide, I, frankly, if I may be candid, it seems like there's a divide within the administration between how we treat um, uh, General Sisi and, and, and his uh, group uh, because some people feared the Muslim Brotherhood, even though they had been elected, um, 
uh, and saw what they were doing to quash democracy after they were elected, uh, and saw them as spreading throughout th this region um, uh, from Libya through into the Gulf, uh, a potentially dangerous, divisive message. And so I'm, I'm just wondering, th let's take a step away from the Iran problem and look at this growing divide. Are we seeing you know, fault lines spreading across this region that make it a potential you know, Balkans again? And I don't mean the Balkans of the 90s. I mean the Balkans of 1914. Yeah, a couple of things. One is, um, that's, you, know, the, the, you mentioned books. The book I'm currently rereading is David Franklin's book, A Peace and All Peace, which I would recommend reading and rereading to everybody here. Really a magnificent history of that period uh, in Middle East history. Um, with respect to Iran, and uh, first to go to that, and, and it, and it uh, um, being, print, uh, being predominantly a Shia uh, Muslim state, our disagreements with Iran and our issues with Iran don't have to do with that. No, I they have to do with Iranian behavior across a whole range of issues, including a nuclear program that they have pursued clandestinely uh, in the face of the international community. It includes, obviously, support for terrorism. Uh, it includes a, a, a destabilizing activities generally in the region around the world. First point. The second point is, is that the is that the uh, the uh, conflicts in the in the Sunni Muslim community, which are uh, very significant, obviously, are not new either. Uh, and indeed, we saw that 9/11, uh, um, uh, and in this and in its aftermath. And it is reflective of kind of the multiple levels of change and conflict that's going on in the Middle East. And Syria obviously encapsulates all that, right? Uh, you know, Syria begins as a uh, as a, a, a nonviolent resistance to the Assad government. The Assad government reacts violently, so you have a, basically what were uh, civilian activists and some military, uh, military folks who deserted and opposed the regime. It then uh, evolved into a more of a, um, a secular uh, uh, fight inside, uh, inside uh, Assyria, and now has evolved into really what is kind of a proxy conflict uh, um, uh, in, in, uh, in Syria. Um, Principally between uh, Iran and its and, it, uh, and its uh, the groups that it supports and uh, 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 other Sunni and other Sunni groups, and then but also it's evolved into kind of he said conflict within the Sunni groups. There, uh, it's a challenge uh, for us, um, and one of course one of the potential outcomes in Syria that you can imagine is a cantonization or fragmentation of Syria, uh, and you would see it all presented there, right? Uh, these various conflicts and. Uh, uh, and strains in, in the Middle East. We, we just did a, an exercise with the U.S. Institute of Peace on Monday gaming out possible outcomes in Syria. And I would say that one of the most likely outcomes that a group of 50 or 60 yeah. experts came to was a fragmented Syria. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's what, certainly one you'd have, to, you'd have to think about as a real possibility. Uh, I don't know that I would disagree with that, with that analysis. And you'll see it all presented there, right? Uh, which, will, by the way, will present an ongoing, very serious security challenge uh, to the region and to the United States going, going forward. What to do about this uh, is, and the United States is very clear on this, but is to side with, with a, a, a moderate groups, groups that are, are opposed to violence. Um, we are going to have to do, and we have lots of cases of first impression here to work on, in North Africa, for example, uh, we're going to have to do, I think, a lot more work on capacity building uh, to, con uh, to confront these groups and to give these new governments and, and uh, moderate uh, forces the capability to deal with the security challenge that we, that we face. Okay. Now, I don't want to just expose you to this group in a way that, um, that, that you don't have a little bit of an advantage, a little bit of an insight. And if you recall from last year, before we opened it up, one of the things we did was we did some polling okay. of the group. And I think we have seven questions that, that we do. Do we have seven questions? So let's, let's do seven questions. Here, you, you, you can sort of see the stage. Yeah. And we'll go through this. It'll take us four or five minutes. Um, the first is, the recent NSA scandal has the potential to undermine U.S. foreign and strategic relations most in Germany, Brazil, the U.K., Russia, or other. And it takes eight seconds to answer this question, and I'm going to go look for a microphone. Oh, there it is. Um, and so... Well, Germany and Brazil lead the list. Somebody said other. We know the rules here. Who said other? What? I, I think what you're really looking at is relations between the EU as, as a whole and the United States, specifically with regard to data privacy. OK. Anybody else? Yes? I don't think it will have a long-term negative impact on the 
He said he doesn't think it'll have a long-term negative impact on anyone. There was an earlier question on this where this group said that where we're headed is to more acceptance of government surveillance. Do you want to comment on it before we get on to the next question? <laughs> well, a couple of things. First of all, and obviously there's been significant impacts from the Snowden, from the Snowden uh, uh, disclosures. Uh, they obviously impact bilateral and political relations, and I think the comment is right about uh, looking at the overall the impact between the United States and the EU uh, generally, including in the TTIP negotiations. But David, I think that the uh, um, and I do I think with respect to the with respect to the uh, to, to, to the allied countries and partner countries listed here uh, that we'll work that through. I think with them we have a relationships with uh, um, with countries around the world, particularly with Europe, with the European countries. Uh, that are, that are deep in terms of our intelligence relationships. So there are, some, there are some competitive aspects to this which have been reflected here, but there are also deep cooperative aspects also which benefit both, both nations. Uh, I think that will be worked through. The impact that I've become uh, increasingly concerned about is not on bilateral relationships between the United States and countries of the United States and a political group. It's rather the impact uh, commercially, uh, which we're seeing in terms of U.S. companies uh, and they're very worried about it, U.S. companies in Silicon Valley, uh, particularly cloud prov providing companies, about how they're going to be treated abroad in terms of selling their, uh, their and they've been very successful because it is the best, the best uh, equipment and approaches in the world, how they're going to be treated in terms of their ability to sell into these markets, uh, whether there are going to be additional requirements and costly requirements on companies who do business around the world in terms of having to have, for example, uh, to maintain the information on, 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 on uh, citizens in that country within that country and building out other servers and other kinds of facilities. Um, I do worry a lot about the, uh, about the commercial uh, impacts around these folks. And we worry about the balkanization of the internet, which could, which could result. The other thing I worry about with respect to this is this taking the, given uh, some countries in the world, particularly the Chinese, uh, the argument that, well, you've all, you've mentioned the Sunnyland Summit. I was in charge of coordinating and putting together the Sunnyland Summit in California with the Chinese this last June. We did have a direct conversation with the Chinese about uh, cyber-enabled theft. Uh, and put it at the core of our economic discussions with the Chinese, there'll be pushback, and there was pushback shortly after the Snowden release. Well, of course, you're engaged in uh, uh, cyber efforts around the world, and look at the Snowden documents. It's different. It's not equivalent. We shouldn't, we shouldn't let it be seen as equivalents. There's a difference between espionage and cyber-enabled theft, which is what we're worried about with the Chinese. But I worry that that conversation has gotten off track a little bit because of that. We need to get it back on track. Yeah, one, one group estimated that the cost to U.S. Uh, companies operating overseas would be $35 billion. Another group estimated closer to $100 billion. I spoke to a Brazilian diplomat who said that if they move to the system that they're move, talking about, which is a Brazilian email system for the government and government-related agencies, the cost to Microsoft alone would be a billion dollars. So I think your point is well taken there. Let's go to another question. Uh, the non-traditional national security issue most important for the U.S. to address is a comprehensive national energy policy, a national program to attract investment, a national program to enhance education and training, an R&D program to develop and deploy transformational technologies, or other. So I guess I would, what, what people do in the answer, I, I would comment that I think that the question may be outdated at this point, because I don't know that several of those are non-traditional security concerns today. I think that they're at the core of what we're doing. Well, it was written two weeks ago, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it says here to enhance education and training, and uh, energy policy was second. You and I certainly talked about that. Somebody else said other. What was other? Yes? Climate change. Climate change is another one which may, may fall into that. Did anybody else say other? Um, all right, let's go to a couple other questions, and then, then I'll let you respond to a couple of them so we don't get bogged down here on the questions. Five more questions. The sequester and reduction in defense spending will severely undercut U.S. security. A, true. B, false. Of course, the deal that was just cut has some adjustments in that, the one announced yesterday. And so the answer here, in your eyes, is um, heavily false. 75, three out of four of you think that is not going to have a long-term impact. Next. The greatest latent security threat for which U.S. leaders are the least prepared are cyber, biological, climate, resource nationalism, or other. And your view is 
climate and environmental. Somebody said other. Who said other? Somebody's shy, so I'm going to skip over it. What do you think the answer to this question is? The security threat for which we're least prepared. Well, I, yeah, there's been attention paid to, to, to all these. Uh, I have to tell you, I, I, um, we have a long way to go with respect to all of them, I think, is a short answer to the question. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of attention paid to cyber, obviously, a tremendous amount of investment. I don't think we're there, frankly, uh, with respect to consistent best practices across the government and across the private sector. We have a tremendous amount of work to do, I think, on that. Biological is probably the one, I think, at the highest levels uh, that I don't think gets the level of attention that it, uh, that it uh, deserves. And climate and energy disasters have been the focus of a tremendous amount of effort uh, in, uh, by, the, uh, uh, by security plans. I don't know if you recall this, but once when we had the conversation before the Sunnyland Summit, you talked about cyber as sort of four sets of kind of questions. Yeah. And you said we're really sort of zeroing in on the cyber against econo in econo US economic interests. But it was an interesting way to structure it. I was just wondering if you'd talk about it. Well, I think if you have to, I mean, cyber, cyber threats, I don't, you know, it's a, I, I think it's best divided into a number of, 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 uh, of threats because they're very different. Uh, and you have uh, uh, threats against critical infrastructure. Uh, and that, is, that essentially involves a, a number of approaches, which mainly is defensive and making sure that our country is as uh, adopts the best practices that are, that are, uh, that are necessary, uh, has the right level of cooperation and coordination between the private sector and the public sector in terms of threats being uh, communicated out to the, uh, uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the private sector. I think it would actually involve, I think, uh, passing legislation here, which has been pending in the Congress, which would give companies greater ability to cooperate among themselves without fear of antitrust liability and give the government greater ability to communicate and work with them. A lot of this is also about cyber hygiene. You know, if you look at the examples around the world of where you've had a, a successful cyber uh, infiltrations on uh, in critical infrastructure, it's been around uh, bad practices. So we really need tremendous amount of effort, and it's going to be ongoing effort. That's category one, as I think about it. Category two would be flat-out espionage, uh, which countries uh, which countries engage in. And in our case, you know, against us, that's mainly uh, aimed at our industrial base and our government uh, networks, and those networks need to be obviously enhanced and protected uh, going forward. A third are efforts to uh, 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 shut down the internet, so censor the internet, uh, and we need to make sure that our cyber efforts here don't provide excuses to do that. Uh, and the fourth would be in this area of cyber enhanced uh, espionage, uh, uh, cyber enhanced theft, which is a multi billions of dollar problem uh, in the United States, and it really is uh, 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 most effectively carried out uh, and principally carried out in terms of volume by entities supported by the Chinese. And this really does need to, to be, continue to be at the center of the economic conversation between the United States and China. We won't make progress unless it is. We won't make progress with the Chinese on this unless they have to weigh their ongoing efforts here against the impact on the overall relationship. And it needs to be done at the highest levels and repeatedly. OK. I think we have three more questions. The regional issue that, if unchecked, is most likely to lead to significant upheaval and all of these may, extremism in Africa, decay in the Middle East, declining confidence in the US political system, escalating terrorism in the South China Sea, impact of austerity in Europe, or growing autocracy in Russia. And I'll throw in Russia's near abroad while we're at it, just because it's in the news today. And so in your view, well, um, uh, decay in the Middle East, uh, which garners the headlines, and declining confidence in the US political system. Uh, interestingly, the impact of austerity in Europe is cited by zero of you uh, um, as something to lead to potentially a significant upheaval. What do you think of the response there, Tom? Well, I think that um, um, a couple of things. First of all, I think that B and C obviously are, um, could have significant impacts on the United States and its security environment. Um, with respect to the Middle East, we have, as I said, an evolving security situation. It really is, for the United States right now, principally a, um, a security challenge in the Middle East, uh, uh, to try to reach some sort of security equilibrium here. Uh, the, the United States has underway a number of efforts uh, to address this. The Iran effort at the center, obviously the Middle East peace process, our efforts in Syria to, get, to do away with the chemical weapons, maybe get to a political a process there, and our ongoing efforts uh, in North Africa. Um, 
it has, it's the place where Al-Qaeda is evolving. Uh, we undertook uh, in the Obama administration from the outset a relentless effort to go after core Al-Qaeda in South Asia. That effort has been, has been highly successful, frankly, in terms of reducing that threat to the homeland. Uh, but Al-Qaeda has evolved. And although the groups in North Africa today don't present that kind of threat to the homeland, they continue to evolve and they do present a threat to U.S. interest in the region. And of course, we discussed the threat that, that's, that is uh, uh, in Syria today, uh, especially if it does become a fragmented, uh, fragmented place and you have op give operational space uh, to the most extreme groups, which would be a real security challenge for the United States. But in, in Asia, and you know this has been a big focus of my, uh, my, my work, um, uh, D there really is a, something to keep a very, close, a very close eye on. Why do I say that? Think about uh, uh, what, would what would have happened in uh, the East China Sea situation over the last three weeks if the United States weren't as present and as active as it was. Conduct that thought experiment. You can conduct that thought experiment really over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, absent the United States effort uh, and presence and engagement there, uh, the combination of history and territory and nationalism really could lead to some very unfortunate results, and, 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 and perhaps most, uh, most likely through accident or, or miscalculation. So very important uh, where, you, where you could have a, uh, you really could see a uh, potential um, downward spiral, which would have a big impact on, big impact are, on the United States. Are we seeing something kind of big happening here? You know, in the, the third plenum, in the meeting of the leadership yeah. in, in China and their, their forward planning, it seems like they're reconsidering the structure of their military. So the military was structured in China on a domestic regional basis. That's how it was ordered. And now it looks like they're moving towards a, a basis a little bit like ours, where you have an army and navy and air force. But essentially what that means, the, you know, sort of the, 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 the meaning between the lines is the potential for more of an outward focus than an inward focus. Uh, and you, you, the Chinese are uneasy with depending on the U.S. to protect their energy supply lanes. Uh, they're clearly testing their ability to project their force out into places like the South China Sea. Is this a watershed in China's military stance towards the rest of the world? I don't know if it's a watershed, but I mean, as, as, it, as these institutions like the Chinese military get bigger and get more resources and get more capabilities, they want to use those capabilities. And they, are, and they do think about resource, uh, resource supply uh, protection and about the, their kind of needs over the next, over the coming decades. I think the, the, the more important message out of the third plenum, and certainly if I were having conversations with the Chinese, I would be underscoring is this, is that the principal challenge, strategic challenge facing China is to continue their social and economic development, that they face tremendous challenges uh, with respect to that uh, going forward. Uh, I think in my conversations with the Chinese leadership, that, that is the overwhelming focus of the Chinese leadership at this point, that is domestic social and economic development. Uh, part of that also is their, is, their, is, is their internal security situation, which we can talk about, which obviously gets a big, gets a big emphasis. Uh, but uh, that is, if that's your principal strategic priority, uh, the one path that you go down that could throw you off that with certainty would be a conflict with the United States. I think what they saw, and I think miscalculated in the East China Sea situation, where I think they probably saw this as the next step in building their sovereignty claims in the East China Sea, uh, where under international law, presence and activity gives you a leg up in terms of proving ultimately your sovereignty claims. I think what they saw that is that that's not costless. It just can't kind of be, be uh, directed just at Japan uh, in that case. You saw it also uh, implicated South Korea, who objected strongly. And the United States came in objecting strongly. And I think that's an important role for us to play here. Uh, but, to, uh, but to underscore this trade-off, right, uh, that in fact, um, if that's your strategic priority, if that strategic priority is informed by having a constructive and productive relationship with the United States, then these external activities need to take that into account. Okay. Are there two more? One more? There, there are four more? Well, just, let's go as quickly as we can. Let's do all four of them. Which U.S. strategic alliance poses the greatest threat to long-term U.S. interests and is in need of strengthening? Saudi Arabia, uh, Israel, uh, Egypt, Pakistan, and other. In other words, which, I, I think better way to put it is, which strategic alliance uh, is in the most precarious state right now? And, and what is the, uh, you know, it poses the longest term threat to us as a result of that precariousness? <coughs> Pakistan, so by, by a landslide. 
So we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's, let's go through the remainder of the questions. An economic slowdown poses the greatest political and security risks in which emerging market? Emerging markets are hitting headwinds right now. They're likely to hit more headwinds as we begin to taper and take some of the liquidity out of the global economic bathtub, if you will. Uh, some of these people are going to feel it first. China, India, Turkey, Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, other. Which do you fear adverse economic winds uh, may cause the biggest problem for us in? Okay, so China, by a long shot, is of concern. Next. Which of the following outcomes from the U.S. energy boom has the greatest potential to enhance U.S. economic and security standing in the world? Lower energy prices, reshoring of manufacturing, domestic job creation, reduction in the power of OPEC, new leverage with energy-hungry nations that we can supply, for example, gas to or other. There's soft power associated with these things. Which has got the most leverage? And so 27% say domestic job creation, which I guess is a stabilizing factor here. And 23% say lower energy prices, which of course drives investment into the United States uh, and fuels growth uh, and, and profitability. Next, and finally, Compared to the other major powers, 10 years from now, the U.S. will be relatively weaker than where we are today, relatively stronger than where we are today, about the same as where we are today. And this will be the last one of these, and I'm going to turn to you, Tom, for a comment on this, and then open it up to the floor for questions um, uh, from anyone. And I've I got to say, as a group, you are not a great deal of help. Um, I, uh, you, you will have support no matter what your view is on this, Tom. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, reminds me of chairing the meetings in the Situation Room. <laughs> looking for, uh, looking for. Uh, <laughs> does, does this? I know the NSC has grown tremendously. I didn't think this was kind of what Situation Room meetings looked like. Right. Days, some some days it felt like this. But yeah. The, 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 uh, I think I'm, I, my uh, approach to this would be that would be this would be that if you actually uh, do an, uh, look at this analytically, as opposed to impressionistically, or looking at the kind of the things that happened in the last 60 days or last year, you know, Syria and things like this, uh, that in fact that the fundamental balance sheet of the United States, I think, really does ensure it's, it, it, it will be the leading country if we make the right decisions, make the be the leading country for a long time. Uh, and by that I mean, if you look at it, it's kind of, if you look at it as, a, as an assets and liabilities balance sheet, the assets the United States has are substantial uh, in terms of its economy, its wealth, its geography, its demography, uh, its energy future, its alliances, uh, the strength of its military, uh, its innovation, its higher education. Uh, all that really, in total, as a, as, a, as a combined ecosystem, if you will, of U.S. strengths is unmatched in the world and is likely to be unmatched in the world for a long time to come. The United States has challenges, obviously, in debt, in, uh, in its primary and secondary education system, its infrastructure, uh, long-term unemployment, uh, uh, skills uh, uh, challenges in the United States. All those are uh, really uh, uh, can be met by political decisions and will. Uh, they're not inherent, uh, inherent uh, uh, weaknesses that the United States has. So I, as I look at kind of analytically, look at the U.S. balance sheet uh, and compare it to the rest of the world, uh, as I said, you go through, go through it you know, kind of carefully through a dozen dimensions. Uh, the United States is uh, in well positioned to be uh, the most important and leading country in the world for a long time to come. Secondly, uh, uh, Joe Jaffe has a book out uh, called The Myth of American Decline, which got published, I think, three or four weeks ago. Uh, it's, worth, it's worth to read. It does a comparative analysis. So I just did kind of a straight up analysis on looking at just the U.S. balance sheet. It does a comparative analysis about comparing that U.S. balance sheet to the balance sheets of others and reaches the same conclusion. And in fact, the United States is likely to be, uh, uh, if we make the right political decisions, uh, the strongest uh, country in the world really uh, for a long time to come. And that all our challenges, frankly, are with our matters of political will. And he also makes the interesting point that, in fact, that these, that these discussions about decline are quite cyclical in the United States. They've been going on a long time. 
Uh, and I would argue, Sam Huntington actually argued this as well, um, that uh, in that discussion, this kind of compulsion that the United States has to have this discussion all the time about whether we're up, whether we're down, that, that's where the roots of our renewal are. Uh, and that's been the case in the United States, uh, uh, at least you know, certainly since World War II, if you, do, if you do a study of that. So I'm quite optimistic. Uh, thanks. But also thanks for the reference to Samuel Huntington, who was the founder of foreign policy. Um, I, I also, it, I recall from last year's discussion, you made a point that resonated with one of those that, that, that you just said there, which was uh, one of our most underestimated strengths was our network of alliances around yes. the world. That we have this asset, and if you look at China, or you look at these other powers, they don't have the relationships, and if they're in good shape now, or in weak, or whatever, we have them, and that's a, that's a, that's a big deal. It's a very big deal, and it also underscores one of the, you know, kind of a current challenge, which is never to take this for granted and go back, and obviously, to these alliances repeatedly, to renew, refresh them, and underscore the importance of these. There's a very big difference in this world between leverage and alliances, between these kinds of leadership and win-win uh, uh, relationships and just sheer cold leverage. The United States has a lot of the leadership capacity here, the alliances which are unparalleled. I mean, if China looks out in its periphery uh, and, in its, and in the region, they see relationships that you could compare, I guess, with alliances with North Korea, Laos, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe Cambodia, uh, whereas the United States, of course, looks out through really 50 or 60 years of bipartisan work of providing public goods in the region. Uh, and sees a very strong set of alliances and partnerships. Indeed, I would argue there's even a stronger demand signal in the region right now for a lot of reasons we can discuss to have those alliances and partnerships deepened. Okay, so questions from the floor. Chris. Hi. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Hi. <coughs> Chris Grant, Um I haven't seen much mention of something you see a marking on. Excuse me. Pardon me? Can you turn it on? I, I think it's, is it not on? You're in the communications yeah, business. You should, yeah, there. It only works for David. <laughs> it's filtered against you. Yes. <laughs> so the question is, why is education as a national security threat left off of some of these? Because a couple of years ago, I think it was Condoleezza Rice was leading something at CFR, education as national security threat, beyond just competitiveness. And if you look at top folks, whether it's cybersecurity or whether it's military or industrial competition, we're badly lagging. We're in a city where I think the high school graduation rate is about 50% now, and high school graduation means functional literacy, really. So when we look forward to your last question about the United States doing better, comparatively weaker, comparatively stronger, why, how could we possibly be stronger if in the next 20 years we keep falling behind in education? Well, because we're blessed with all the, with, with the assets that I, that I, that I laid out. I, the education story, I think, is really is a story of great strengths and real challenges. Spectacular strengths at the higher education level in the United States. Uh, if you look at most of the studies, there's a Singapore study that gets cited a lot that shows that 17 of the 20 most uh, prestigious and most accomplished universities in the world are US, are US uh, institutions. Uh, if you spend time in Silicon Valley, we have an asset there that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Thousands of ideas being generated every year, right? And now, and increasingly, in all sectors of our life, uh, our personal life, health care, transportation, communication, a tremendous innovative uh, strength that we have uh, in, the, uh, in the United States. So that's, that, that's on, that goes on the asset list, right? And indeed, if you look at the iconic technology and, and uh, uh, companies, innovative companies in the world, that list is a U.S. list of companies. Uh, uh, right now, but we have, as you as you pointed out, Chris, we have a cha we have challenges in our, uh, our primary and secondary education system, which need to be addressed. And they need to be addressed because it goes to a fundamental pillar of eco of national security strength, and that is economic strength. Uh, uh, you know, President Obama said in a speech at West Point uh, something I, don't, I wanted exactly right, but I think the sentiment really underscores an iron law of history. There's not a lot of iron laws of history which is that no nation's ever been able to maintain its military and political primacy without maintaining its economic vitality. And this education issue goes right to that. I agree with you, it's gonna be a focus of investment, but it's a matter of political will and decision, not a matter of some sort of inherent barrier. Yeah, I think there's an interesting point embedded in that, which we often don't think about when we look at these studies. People are in public school systems or in traditional education systems for 12 years. They're then in the workforce where they're trained throughout their lives. In the United States, that means that for 40 or 50 years, they're trained by leading corporations in a different kind of environment. 
And so the lifelong training advantage that we have, in addition to the second or the higher education training advantage we have, is different. But Moody. there's some real worries there, though, too, David. You know, yeah. that, and the, and the three or four things that, that I've noticed in the last, just in the last few months, right? There's an OECD study of, of skills uh, put out in the last maybe 60 days, uh, and it and it had a, a it's really a striking finding, which which showed uh, that the skill sets of U.S. I won't get the age cohort right, but let's say 40 to 55, right, was better when compared globally than the skill sets of younger people. That is really something to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, for the first time to have you know, kind of younger people's skill sets not comparing as well internationally as older American skill sets. I, I, number one. Number two, uh, this long-term unemployment challenge is a, it's a whole other discussion, but I think really is something that, that we, have to, we have to address. And third, an interesting study that I saw recently uh, underscoring the fact that Americans don't trust each other as much as they used to in the past, which is an important part of our economic success here, too. But I fully agree on the education point. But it's not, it's not just, it's not a simple story, and it's not just a challenge. It's also, we also have tremendous assets and advantages in the United States. Mooney. Hello, I'm Mooney Figueres from Costa Rica. Yes, uh, turning to Latin America, if I may, do you envisage a deepening of alliances within the hemisphere particularly built around energy. Um, thinking, of course, Canada, the US, Mexico as a first unit, but also the enormous resources in uh, Brazil, Peru, uh, Argentina even, um, Colombia. Do you see the US leading that kind of effort yeah. as, as part of its energy leadership? I, well, I, I, I absolutely do, and indeed, um, uh, it should, be, it should be an important, if I stayed on a national security advisor, it certainly would have been an important personal priority of mine. Uh, the integrative opportunities in this hemisphere are tremendous. Uh, I think about, uh, Bob Zellick actually gave a, a, a speech on this uh, recently, uh, the former Deputy Secretary of State Trade Negotiator, where he, where he called kind of the, this hemisphere kind of our base, right? Uh, uh, and it really is, and it's a tremendous base. Uh, uh, that the United States and our partners in the region have. And the integrative opportunities really are tremendous. Most, uh, uh, most importantly, I think, in the energy, in the energy sector, and we're seeing that. Uh, we have tremendous opportunities uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of integration, not just in North America, by the way, uh, but as, as you go, uh, we have uh, reforms underway in Mexico, which will be tremendously important, I think, in terms of Mexico uh, more effectively and efficiently in uh, developing its energy resources. And we have real opportunities and. and uh, in South America as well. I think it should be an important priority because it really is a, uh, an opportunity for us to have a, uh, a much more secure uh, uh, energy supply uh, for all our countries. Okay, you know, one of the things that happens as, as the world changes, you know, organizations like ours that try to cover the world change as well. And four years ago when foreign policy really sort of launched into the web, we had a, a website that was largely uh, opinion and analysis, uh, but as the world started moving and as more people started coming to the website all day long, we recognized it was our obligation to move towards more reported content. And so over the course of the past two years, we vastly expanded our reporting resources so that we could look at the world in real time, provide you with information in real time, and one of the reporters that we've added in the past year who's already made huge contributions is Yoki Driesen, and so he seems to have a question, and I don't want to hold him back because it sends the wrong signals. <laughs> uh, thank you, David, and uh, Tom, thanks for being here. Great. Um, if I could ask a question, please, about Syria. Yeah. Um, the administration for a while had said that uh, Assad had lost legitimacy, couldn't be part of Syria's future. At the same time, the chemical weapons deal seems to depend on him showing us where the weapons are, ensuring that they could be brought out of the country safely. Uh, two related questions. Um, does the deal, can it be done without Assad's cooperation? Uh, and if not, doesn't that effectively boost his chances of staying in power? Thank you. Well, there's, I think there's a, uh, I, I think about it in two different ways. One is that uh, with respect to the chemical weapons deal, uh, it is uh, very important to successfully complete this. I think it's actually a project that can get done. Uh, if you look at the progress that's made so far, we have, and again, you know, you fail. 100%, uh, you, know, you, you can never you have to look and see if, uh, in terms of compliance whether so it's 100% or not, but, but, the, but the signals right now are that in fact the, the uh, categorization and listing of the chemical weapons and the associated materials and production facilities have been listed out. We have a plan now to go forward uh, to uh, destroy uh, those uh, facilities um, 
supplies and actual, and, and actual weapons. Uh, uh, I think that is, it seems to be on track and I think can be successfully completed. Uh, it's an important joint project that the Russians and the United States have entered into and that uh, uh, I think is an, really an important aspect of this. Uh, at the end of the day, if as David laid out, the, uh, one of the possible, real possible outcomes here is fragmentation or cantonization of Syria, we will be very happy, both we and the Israeli government and everybody in the region will be very happy and fortunate that we successfully completed eliminating the chemical weapons threat in Syria and not have that available in that kind of chaotic circumstance where we have cantonization or fragmentation uh, in Syria. Uh, and we're doing this, obviously, through a uh, cooperative arrangement working with the UN, the important UN agency uh, that, that, uh, uh, that's overseeing this. And it is a far superior outcome, by the way, uh, I think, than a limited military attack as a deterrent on, on the chemical weapons. Here we actually have the opportunity to eliminate the chemical weapons. So I think this is a, 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 an unalloyed positive. Uh, and if at the end of the day it is successful, it will be a policy success. That's the first point. Uh, now that has taken cooperation of the Syrian government, uh, uh, but there's going to be a Syrian government, right, you know, and a Syrian army uh, with whom a negotiation will have to take place uh, going forward. And that's the second challenge, obviously, uh, which is the challenge of a political settlement and trying to get some reduction in the violence and move towards a political settlement. That's still uh, a, a project that's in front of us, I think. Uh, but I don't think that uh, it uh, should be seen as undermined by the chemical weapons approach. Uh, there are going to have to be some elements of the Syrian government with whom the opposition deals in order to have a political settlement if one is achievable. Uh, I can't imagine at the end of the day that that political settlement would involve Assad staying on in any significant role. Okay, but I wouldn't under, don't, this, this is a really important project to get done and get done right for a variety of perspectives including the cooperative, uh, the cooperative aspects between Russia and the United States hey, and, and, for, and, not, and, and avoiding worst possible outcomes in the event of fragmentation. Some of you may wonder, wonder why I'm wandering around the room like this as opposed to doing it in traditional fashion. There's a couple of reasons. One of them is it knits together a big room like this so it makes it feel a little smaller and makes more people feel engaged. And I think that's important to our dialogue. But it also gives me a perspective on some of Washington's leading minds. So I go by tables that have journalists at them and policy people. And all these Rubik's cubes are sitting in the middle of the table untouched. They're not trying it. I go by tables that have global thinkers at them. They're playing with the Rubik's Cubes trying to solve them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, whatever lesson you want to take from that, uh, you may. <laughs> you, well, this one isn't solved. There are people other. Nora over there solved hers in, in 90 seconds. But, uh, uh, but in any event, uh, we have seven minutes left here in this panel, which means two quick questions and two quick answers. I've known Ed Lutvek here for a while. And I've never heard him ask a quick question, but I'm going to take a risk. So ask a quick question, we'll get a quick answer, and then I'll go over to you. The word around in East Asia is that even though every American enterprise in the Muslim world, the Arab world, fails, nevertheless, the Americans will continue to be obsessed with this thing called the Middle East and this whole territory where nothing works. And therefore, they will not attend to the Chinese expansionism. The B-52 uh, response to the proclamation of the ADS was a very nice response, which was undercut a few hours later when Simpac let it be known that the B-52s were not armed, this being the first such flight. So the issue is, this morning, the actual opinions of people on the importance of different issues, the questions that were asked, would appear to give, you know, to justify this p position in East Asia that actually the Americans will continue to be obsessed in these places where nothing works. So, uh, so, so the question in that was yeah. what? The question in that is, no, do you see a way for us to emancipate ourselves without yes. this obsessive interest in what goes on in these places like Syria or Afghanistan or yeah. Egypt where there have never been any good outcomes and where no foreign intervention, economic, diplomatic, or military has ever succeeded? Yeah. That's the question. And the we, the, the we, opportunity for the, the tremendous opportunity for the United States in Asia. The United States' uh, future is linked to Asia's future, no <laughs> doubt about it. When we came into office, we undertook this study. We asked ourselves in the transition, I chaired the State Department of National Security Transition for President Obama, we asked ourselves the following question. Where were we overinvested and where were we underinvested in the world? 
What should the footprint of the United States look like in the world? What should the face of the United States be to the world? There are a lot of aspects to what we call this rebalancing. The one that gets the most focus is the geographic rebalancing, which you're, focus, which you're, uh, which you're pointing to. And we determined that, in fact, that we were way underinvested across every dimension, political, economic, security, military, in uh, Asia, and that we were way overinvested in terms of military action and assets in the Middle East. And we undertook to rebalance that. We withdrew from Iraq over the course of 16 or 17 months from 160,000 troops down to, down to no troops. We are on track with, in Afghanistan to finish that project by the end of December 2014 and look to a rebalancing of assets and, a, and emphasis to Asia. Uh, so uh, you won't get an argument from me in terms of kind of the attention, mind share, and all elements of national power that should be brought to bear with respect to our interest in, the, in Asia. And you won't get any argument from me that we were unbalanced. Now, we're a global power and challenges come up, uh, and we're going to have to continue to attend to those challenges. What we can't allow to happen, though, is allow kind of the issue of the day uh, to take us off track in terms of the strategic move uh, to deeper engagement in Asia. I think that engagement actually is underway in a very significant way across the dimensions that I outlined. Our alliances in Asia are much stronger than they were four and a half years ago. And even during the period over the last six months, we've deepened our alliance with respect to the Japanese in Japan. There are a lot of new dimensions to it. We're deepening our alliance in the Philippines, including working on additional access uh, 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 understandings with the, with the Philippines. Um, we have uh, on the crust the, uh, uh, implemented the security aspects of the rebalance that we have put in place with the goal of having 60% of our assets there by 2020. That is on, that is on track. Uh, we have been deeply engaged politically, including politically, over the course of, uh, during the course of this consideration of the unilaterally declared and very uh, uh, escalatory and destabilizing uh, air defense identification zone by the, uh, by the Chinese. Uh, so you don't get an argument from me with respect to the opportunity. Uh, I want to underscore all the elements of this that are going forward. I think the United States paid a price for President Obama's inability to go uh, in November to Asia, including the two summits. Uh, and we have uh, laid on, uh, the United States has laid on and announced a trip to, uh, in April uh, to visit the countries that he wasn't able to visit. But we did pay a price for that, no doubt about it. Two very important summits and an, op an opportunity with respect to the economic element of the rebalance, which is the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the most important trade negotiation in the world right now. The President would have had the opportunity to see the TPP partners face to face. We're working on that uh, to try to get that uh, negotiation done uh, by the end of the year or shortly, there, shortly thereafter. So all these elements are underway. I think we did pay a price. I think it is important for us to keep front and center the strategic priority of rebalancing to Asia. Um, and to look for opportunity in the world, and that really where, is where the opportunity. That doesn't diminish the fact that we have continuing security challenges have to be dealt with in the Middle East. That's my, that's my approach. Okay, so I, you, you and I talked a minute ago, and you said, I have a question, and it was kind of like, tell us about the whole future of the world and how the US is set up to deal with it. But you, you have 30 seconds for the question, and he has 60 seconds for the answer, okay. so keep that in mind. America has a strong military arm. Have we got the configuration of our civilian foreign policy instruments right? Are they adequate to the challenges we face today? And I'm thinking not just of state and AID, but the non-governmental world and the contracting world, as well as the NSC, of course. Well, uh, a couple of points. I think that the, uh, uh, that the structure of decision making in the government that the United States has is sound and admired around the world in the National Security Council process. David's the leading expert uh, uh, on that. And I think it works, pretty, I think it works pretty, pretty soundly. I think we have continuing challenges in terms of the imbalance of resources allocated to military and non-military aspects of our national security efforts. Uh, and that, and it, it's still, and I think, by the way, if General Dempsey were here, if Bob Gates were here, if Admiral Mullen were here, they would say the same thing. That in fact, that the United States should be investing a lot more in non-military aspects of its national security apparatus, um, and uh, it's a mistake not to. So that's my, that would be my answer. I want to go back to, to, to Ed's point just for a second. We do have some, we do have some challenges ahead of us um, on, on this, on the rebalance, and, and, it, and I do think it is very important for us to finish the TPP negotiation. This is the economic pillar of the rebalance. Uh, it is a win-win. Uh, it underscores the fact that the rebalance to Asia is not just about security and military aspects, although it is that. It has a lot of other aspects to it, which are win-win aspects. 
I think to get that done would have a lot of salutary, have salutary uh, uh, implications for the United States economy. It would have salutary uh, implications for the U.S. presence in Asia, actually getting something done here. I think it would have salutary uh, impacts basically on, on the WTO, and I think it would have a salutary impact in terms of reform uh, in, in China. And the second piece of this is it is important in the budget that's upcoming, the defense budget, that we continue to have uh, the resources and focus on uh, rebalancing those resources to military resources to Asia and continue that. Um, and third, I do think that this trip the President's taking in April is important, uh, particularly in light of the fact that he missed two summits in November because of the nonsense in Washington. Exactly. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that in the course of, of this, uh, you've seen what I talked about at the very beginning, the scope of Tom's perspectives, uh, the depth of his perspectives uh, on a wide range of issues around the world. This is precisely what we're trying to um, uh, reveal in these conversations, and we're trying to plumb the depths of some of the best minds that we know. Another way that we can do that uh, is by giving you time with each other, because you're a great group. Uh, and at the end of last year's event, when we talked to people about how to make it better, they said, give us a little bit more time to interact with the other people who are attending. So the way that we've set up this year's event is that following this session, there is a one-hour lunch period, which will begin momentarily. As soon as I stop talking, I assume people will come sweeping through these doors. They will actually bring food to you, so you don't have to go to the food this time. Uh, and we encourage you to stay here, talk, talk to people at other tables. Um, um, and uh, interact with the group within the room. At 1 o'clock, we'll then begin our panel discussion on the Middle East. We have a really extraordinary panel on that. Uh, that will then go on uh, uh, and lead into our discussion on the Atlantic issues and on Pacific issues. Um, and then, uh, following a, a very brief break, we'll have Secretary Kerry, who is going to come in and give an address uh, looking back on this first year uh, that he has um, spent as uh, Secretary of State, which has certainly been a full year, uh, and I think uh, uh, will be a very, very interesting uh, address before he heads off on another trip, which actually happens later tonight. On his 70th birthday. And it is his birthday. I was going to mention that later. I, 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 I just worry that the more earlier I mention it, the more likely it is that people will sing. <laughs> the whole thing will become a little embarrassing for everybody. Uh, Chris is over. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to sing for Carrie's birthday. It is his birthday, uh, and we will mention that uh, later as well. But in any event, so we have a fantastically uh, loaded program for you, not even including this evening and the festivities associated with this evening, uh, and food right around the corner. But before you get to the food, please join me in thanking Tom for a really, really terrific. Thank you.